when I begin, I want to begin by talking a little bit about what we talk about when we talk about the notion of multilinguality in speech and language processing. This is going to be a little bit more discursive. I promise to have hard and fast results about things later. Now, as probably many of you know, early research in speech and language processing, particularly the, the sort of group of work I'll call data-driven speech and language processing, that is the stuff influenced by the machine learning revolution of the 90s onward, was critiqued, and I'd say rightly critiqued, for an over-reliance on uh, English and a few other richly resourced hegemonic languages. So as an urban legend has it, I don't know if this is true, the famous IBM Candide systems, okay, models one through five, the ones that sort of brought us modern statistical machine translation, uh, targeted French to English. They didn't do any English to French. Uh, supposedly this is because uh, almost all the engineers were monolingual English speakers, and they wanted to be able to perform basically target side fluency evaluations sort of informally simply by looking at the data. Of course, they could have gone English to French, or they could have gone uh, Cantonese to English, or whatever. All these things were available to them, but they chose sort of an easy language pair to target, and they ch and they insisted on English as a target side language to make the task easier. But I think we ought to be a little more specific. We ought to say exactly what we mean when we make this critique. What does it mean to over rely on English? So. I want to distinguish between two senses in which the system might be called monolingual. The first one I'll call monolingual by design. Some technical contributions in our field are monolingual des by design in the sense that they are engineered to exploit sort of the typological vagaries of English or other richly resourced hegemonic languages. I'd like to, perhaps this will be controversial, but I would say that any system which treats words as atomic units rather than as the intricately structured units that linguists recognize them to be, might be monolingual by design. If your system uses like one hot um, encoded features that are words, and that's all it uses to sort of get a notion of what context is like, it might have this property. That works decently well in English and one or two other hegemonic languages that happen to be um, morphologically isolating but it's unclear that it would generalize beyond that. Certainly, it's a very poor fit for a, like a polysynthetic language. And to a lesser degree, the same critique might be said of like text-based systems, which sort of assume that word and sentence segmentation is trivial. These systems are not going to do well faced with a language like Thai, which doesn't um, have a sort of a orthographic word indication and doesn't have even have sentence indication in some often you're going to have that system no matter what you do in a language like thai in the, its script you're going to have to deal with a non-trivial amount of error in segmentation even if you sort of build a statistical machine system to do the segmentation there's still going to be a high rate of error that error is going to propagate and your system is going to fall down so i think we all understand this notion of monolinguality Often the critique is not about this, though. It's about a different sense of monolinguality, what I call monolinguality by evaluation. And I think this is far more common than monolingual by design. Systems that are monolingual by evaluation have simply, the researchers have simply failed to demonstrate that the contribution generalizes beyond a single language. Usually, again, the language is English. I think this is mostly what um, Bender is talking about in that well-known paper about um, multilingualism in natural language processing. So at perhaps at some point in the history of the field, one could blame monolinguality by evaluation on the dearth of multilingual resources. One can simply say like, it's just difficult to obtain resources at scale in a wide variety of languages for whatever the I happen to be working on. Dep well, this isn't true for all tasks, for an awful lot of tasks, and almost all the ones I personally am excited about, this is no longer really true. Um, these resources now exist. Um, 
and I want to give credit where credit is due. I think the thing that really kicked this off is actually multilingual work on dependency parsing. Uh, there's a series of challenges that were held in the mid 2000s and every year there were a couple more languages uh, to parse. And this, all, this, is, this sort of body of work, mostly coming out of EU researchers, eventually became the Universal Dependencies Database, which is really quite an impressive accomplishment. It also forced standardization in um, how the dependencies were encoded and labeled. But there's many other success stories here. Uh, Unimorph is obviously a big one. I'll talk a little bit about that and also about Wikipron, which I consider to be a example of a large, free, massively multilingual resource. Uh, things like using the common crawl and exploiting that for this uh, uh, for massively multilingual work is also a good example. So I, I like the one the, the example of CCNet, which is essentially a, a a subsection of the common crawl that has been language ID'd um, with some degree of with like sort of a high precision operating point, and that's really a very useful resource as well. These are used and they're used in communities I run in in at the ACL, but they haven't sort of made a a large impact overall in sort of what kind of work people are are doing at the ACL, for instance. Um, so seven years after Bender's paper, uh, Sabrina Mielke has a little blog post where she looks at exactly this question, um, basically coding what languages are are present in long papers at the ACL. And you really can't discern much of a change from 2004 to 2016, even though the research scenario has changed, I think, quite drastically. Um, there are awful lot more free resources in, and awful lot more free, large, multilingual resources than there used to be, yet there's an awful lot of monolingual English and or also sometimes Chinese work still extremely common. So the resource excuse has gone away, but yet we see, we see that an awful lot of work is simply evaluated on English or Chinese, to use two, two examples. One response to this has been the introduction of massively multilingual models in addition, and data set, we already mentioned data sets, but also like models and shared tasks. So you might argue that like multilingual BERT-like transformer language models are an example of this general trend. Also shared tasks that target many, many languages. It used to be the case that uh, not all that long ago, about the time I entered the field, there were shared tasks that were, would call themselves like multilingual X or multilingual Y, where multilingual meant two languages. I, I happen to know a shared test that was called multilingual and it's just English and German. English and German. Um, and that's it. Another one was English and Spanish that I know of. Uh, nowadays, our standards for sort of what even counts as multilingual have gotten much higher. And we really do have things that, you know, target a hundred or more languages sometimes. Of course, I acknowledge that this is a small sample of the world's languages. Uh, and the sample is pretty heavily biased uh, towards uh, Europe. That said, uh, I think we are making some progress here. But I don't, I'm not convinced this solves the problem. Um, the other critique was that was not just that the work is poorly evaluated, but is, or it wasn't evaluated in large languages, but we didn't even know anything about the data quality. So those of you who have been following along may know that, um, you know, Wikipedia and Wiktionary are often considered high quality resources for these sorts of tasks, particularly when you want large amounts of multilingual data. In the last year or two, we found out that most of Scott's Wikipedia was written by a, a teenager who doesn't speak Scots. Uh, there have been, there was an, another case of this not all that long ago. Somebody else, the, 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 Wik, the Wikipedia was not reflective of the languages is actually used. Scots raises all kinds of questions too, because is it an independent language or is it part of a dialect line? Um, is it really still spoken or, it, or is it directly related to modern Scottish English? These are all interesting questions, which maybe we as computational linguists could weigh in on, um, but this is, that's, that's a question for another day. Um, 
I think the problem is the following. Most research and development is conducted by small teams of engineers and or linguists who are ill-suited to perform quality assurance in dozens, if not hundreds of languages. Um, even if you try to sort of gather a linguistically diverse team, um, it's hard to get, you know, much better than a couple people per language. So say you get six people, maybe you can get a dozen languages. Maybe you can get 15, but certainly you'll never get to 100 with, with a dozen people. It just won't happen. One cannot simply look at the data uh, short of major changes to the way in which we develop these technologies. Um, and this is affecting the quality of our work, our ability to generalize about it as well, to new about its to general to understand about how language these technologies generalized to new languages are influenced in part by this problem. I want to talk about also who benefits when we make these this jump to massively multilingual uh, technology. So if we just, let's just say we, we as a community decide this is one of our values. We want to make our technologies all massively multilingual. We want to be massively multilingual in how we evaluate. We want to be massively multilingual in how we design. What are the consequences and who might benefit? That's what qui bono means in Latin, of course. The first principle, which I think is probably the one that is most salient in our mind, I've tried to sort of break down who benefits and, and who cares about multilingualism in our community. I think the first one is sort of scientists and many people who see themselves as scientists have the following belief. They are interested in testing technologies across many languages and they may prefer technologies found to be universally effective. Um, they may say, say something like, I'm not studying natural language processing in English, I'm studying the processing of natural languages as they actually exist. I've called this principle uniformitarianism. Um, on analogy with the principle of uniformitarianism in like the natural sciences. For those of you who are not familiar with this notion, um, in the natural sciences, uh, the uniformitarian principle holds that like the principles of physics, for instance, are this, um, have not changed over the course of history. So like we can't posit different um, geological or physical forces to account for old rocks than the ones we account for to account for new rocks. This was highly controversial when it was first proposed. Um, many of the models of geology assumed that phys the, sort of the physics of crystal formation were different in biblical times than they were in sort of the modern era. And that could explain some, that could sort of explain some of the facts of the universe is you could sort of, you could sort of posit that physics changed at, at some point in, in, um, in geological history. Uh, obviously that sounds, dangerously unscientific to modern ears, um, is that we use this principle of uniformitarianism often as a heuristic. If we don't know any better, we should assume that like, it's at least possible to design technology that will work across many languages or perhaps all languages if we just sit down and think hard enough. And this, this also applies to people who are working sort of in a, a corporate setting we'd like technologies that work for as many languages as possible because we don't want to design special modules for special languages. I know from my personal industry experience that we often did have modules that, that called things like Russian stress predictor that works completely different than the, the stress predictor for other languages. Um, or uh, that's not uncommon. I, I can think of, or like French liaison model, like maybe, maybe the model for liaison does, it doesn't have, doesn't share any code with anything else. Um, but we'd like to sort of get away from these things. We recognize these as basically technical debts that we want to that we want to pay off eventually. The second um, ethic I think we should talk about is the notion of inclusion, for lack of a better term. Some believe that these technologies ought to be available for all humans, regardless of what languages these humans speak. Um, I have this immediate thought as well. Um, I see some of these technologies as like obviously pro-social or at least having pro-social potential. I see some of them as, as being vaguely sinister or perhaps just sinister. But I think that in a perfect world, we would all have uh, equal access to these technologies and these technologies would not discriminate, would not discriminate against what language we speak. Um, Stephen Bird, who has done quite a bit of work about how these technologies might influence 
um, disadvantaged communities uh, recently critiques this attitude, which I've somehow called the, the gotta catch them all attitude, or, or perhaps you might call it simply the colonial mindset. Um, let me read the quote here. After generations of exploitation, indigenous people often respond negatively to the idea that their languages are data ready for the taking. By treating indigenous knowledge as a commodity, speech and language technologists risk disenfranchising local knowledge authorities, reenacting the causes of language endangerment. I think this is a useful point for us to think about um, that we need to consider stakeholders and, and don't assume that they share our, our gotta catch them all attitude. Just wanted to bring that up. Well, a couple more points here though. Um, another group who stands to benefit from massive multilingualism are corporations. It's not lost on me that quite a bit of work that pushes uh, massively multilingual work as opposed to simply work in, in understudied or endangered lang or lesser resource languages comes from uh, corporate sources. Uh, corporations engage in internationalization in part um, to reach as many speakers as possible. They have an obvious fiduciary incentive to do so. And sort of by standard business logic, um, they want to necessarily proceed so that the unit cost of adding support for language N is less than the cost of adding support for language N. Um, oh, I have a little typo here. I should say the cost for, of adding language N plus one is less than the cost of adding it for language N. So the cost needs to decline as we go from language to language because there are usually less speakers or perhaps less, you know, financial dollar there as we go down. These fiduciary motives may align poorly with scientific ones. So thanks to things like projection techniques, resource disparities, unanticipated technical issues, if you've got a system that say supports 25 languages, it's probably easier to add Macedonian support than it is to add Kenya Rwanda support even though there are quite a few more speakers of Kenya and Rwanda. I know this from experience. Um, Harold Hammerstrom has actually sort of jokingly looked at this with what he calls the gross language product, where he looks at sort of the, uh, the GDP sum summed across all speakers that of um, languages that have feature X or Y. So for instance, he can tell you like, how many dollars are there behind ergative absolutive languages versus how many are there um, on other types of languages that don't have an ergative uh, system? Uh, of course, this is done somewhat tongue in cheek, um, but you, the results are kind of as you expect, like languages that have extremely small phoneme inventories don't account for much of the GDP. Uh, at the same time, languages that have extremely large phoneme inventories don't account for much of the GL or GLP, I guess you should call it. Uh, so, these things may not uh, easily align with um, what we care about when we talk about inclusion or we talk about um, also about uniformitarianism. If we want to reach a maximally diverse sample, um, this may not help, the corporations may not um, be helping us do, do so in the most efficient way possible. Finally, we have to consider about state actors. The defense industry, at least in the states, is a massive source of funding for speech and language technology research and development, and takes particular interest in languages used in states and regions of strategic import. Increasingly, these are less resource languages. Uh, for instance, DARPA, the, which one of the organizations that funds massive amounts of research in these, te in these technologies in the US, um, has increasingly been held challenges in which the whole challenge is to be able to pivot rapidly to a understudied language, to build technologies in a rapidly understudied language, which is usually revealed at the end of the shared task. So you spend most of the task developing general resources, and then you have, maybe have a week to pivot. And I can't help but notice how these, how the languages that are targeted like sort of reflect defense priorities in the US. When I first entered the field, um, the focus was on dialects of Arabic. Interestingly, there was no, there was no focus on Pashto, um, but there was enormous focus on dialects of Arabic. Um, nowadays, uh, the hot language is Uyghur. Oh, you know, say, say what you will about that fact. So I'm gonna pause at this state here um, and take any questions or comments here. I've tried to hit about 15 to 20 minutes. 